This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. You found Corn College TV. I'm Clint Griffiths. Class is in. Today on Corn College TV, we're talking planning depth, measuring it, managing it, and growing our way to higher yields. Missy Bauer hits the field for an early season stand evaluation and how much phosphorus needs to be in starter fertilizer, tips on application rates, and making the transition to vertical tillage. Today on Corn College TV. Hello and thanks for watching Corn College TV. Each week on the show, we add pieces to the agronomic practice we call the systems approach. It's about building better yields block by block. That means breaking everything down and making sure each step is done just right. Today, we're headed back to the planner for a look at setting up those seeds for all season success. All right, Missy, we've uh, gone out, we made sure our planner is level. How do we know if we're getting the right depth on the seed we're putting in the ground? Planting depth is very important. Uh, if we don't have these seeds placed at the proper depth and in good moisture, a good seed to soil contact, we're not going to get that uniformity of emergence we're after to help with that ear count. Okay. So what we want to look for as a rule of thumb with planting depth is typically somewhere between an inch and three quarters to two inches deep. And why is that? Well, part of that is that typically we will get good consistency there as far as moisture, um, but we also got to remember that the crown of this plant, where all our crown root, roots develop, comes out, uh, develops at about three quarters of an inch below the soil surface. So in order to get that real good crown development, we like to be planted at about an inch and three quarters to two inches deep. Okay. So if we get too shallow, sometimes we get issues where we don't get that good crown root development, and it seems to hurt us down the road. And that's really the fuel lines for feeding this entire plant. So how are we going to check that? What I like to do out in the field uh, after we've planted a little bit is to get out uh, in the row and actually just start scraping the soil back and be looking for, for the seeds themselves. Now we want to be careful as we scrape here that we don't knock the seeds out. So you want to be very careful okay. uh, like we are here until we get down to where we can see these actual seeds. And then we would, like, what I like to do is take something and just lay level across the row here and then just take a small tape measure and go ahead and stick it down there and get a measurement. So you can see here we're right at about two, two inches, inches deep. Perfect. So we're going to be in pretty good shape for planting this. The other thing as we dig that trench out, we just look for consistency, making sure that we don't see our planting depth kind of coming up and down uh, across the board. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, rule of thumb, inch and three quarters to two inches deep. However, if it's very early in the season and it's cold, yeah. you know, maybe we're no tillance early in the season, we might want to shallow that up maybe to an inch and a half, but we okay. never want to go shallower than that inch and a half. And what if we're pretty dry in our area, because there's parts of the country that are dealing with that. Yeah, if you get real dry as the season progresses and things start to dry out, if we don't have good moisture down here, say at two inches deep, maybe we got to go go two and a quarter, two and a half. Okay. We've got to make sure this seed has good moisture around it and uniformity of moisture. So okay. that's very, very critical. All right, so we've done one row here, but we've got 16 rows. Do we need to go through and dig every one or is there a faster way to do that? Well, one thing that I encourage people to do because we do want to make sure we don't have a problem with one row. So somehow we've got to check that we feel comfortable across this planter. So obviously the best thing would be to do what we've done here in all the rows. But we understand that time is of the essence too. So one thing I encourage guys to do at a minimum after they've checked a few rows this way is to plant a little bit, stop, lift this planter up, drive forward. What we're doing there is leaving the seed slots open so we have not closed them. That gives us a quick way to walk down the planter and ensure that 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 depth looks uniform across there before we've actually closed this V-trench, okay? Another way that guys do it sometimes is just strap their closing wheels up. So anything we can do to not close this all the way gives us a quick way to check across here what okay. the trench looks like. Okay, great. But a very important part of uh, uniformity and yield at the end of the year. That's correct. And we want to make sure that this planting depth, it's not something that we set once a year, okay? <laughs> this is a field-by-field field daily thing. Okay. So as we get into a field that maybe has a fair amount of sand in it, sure. maybe uh, or whatever our planter set at, we can get that two inches. And if we get into a field that's really hard, maybe got some clay in it, that planter is going to shallow itself up as far as it's not going to be forced into the ground as much. So this is something we do got to check in every field. Okay. And will it 
change as we our seed boxes get less full? Well, we one thing we got to remember on these row units is we're working with the depth setting on the gauge wheels. We're also working with down pressure. So down pressure on this planter, which d does help keep the row unit in the ground as well, will change as these boxes get empty. So that's something you want to keep an eye out. Some of the new technology that's out there to adjust down pressure on the go is pretty helpful from that respect. Up next, we'll show you how to evaluate those properly planted seeds early in the season. Plus, we ask our agronomists about the agronomic difference between 28% nitrogen and anhydrous ammonia. Corn College TV is brought to you in part by Microessentials, the next generation of fertilizer for the next generation of farming. Over the generations, fertilizer, the unsung hero of the farm, has been in the background, quietly nourishing crops with very little fanfare. Until now. Meet the next generation of fertilizer. Micro Essentials. With DeKalb, strength runs deep. All season long, DeKalb stands strong. Powering through the season, standing tall even in the toughest conditions. So when it comes time to harvest, you're bringing out the big scales. Count on industry-leading genetics and advanced genuity traits to help you get more from every acre. For results, you can take to the bin. For strong roots, stalks, and yields, go with the cow. 100 years strong. Hello, folks. This is Mark Gold with Top Third Ag Marketing. If you need help marketing your grains or livestock, give us a call. We offer one-on-one -on -one relationships that can protect you without the threat of margin costs. We don't speculate, we manage risk. If you're tired of paying acreage and management fees for marketing advice that hasn't actually helped your bottom line, then give us a call. Call today to get two weeks of Mark's private grain marketing email. Top Third Ag Marketing, earning the trust of American farmers every day. Some people tend to dream small. Others dream big. But with agriculture's ability to feed the one billion hungry people on the planet and a projected global population of nine billion by the year 2050, it's time to dream huge. Farmers Feeding the World is about agriculture coming together to increase both hunger solutions and food production. Learn more. Give generously. Please dream huge with us. Okay, so you've planted that crop and amazingly it's starting to come up. In today's Head to the Field segment, we're stepping back between the rows for a look at early season stand evaluation. Knowing how good that stand is can help you start managing for how good harvest could be. All right, Missy, we've run the planter. Our plants are, they're up now in the field, but we want to go out and see how we did. Um, how do we evaluate the stand that we have here? I think it's really important to do this early season evaluation. So the first thing that we want to do in order to do that is going to be measure off our thousandths of an acre. Okay. So in this case, we're in 30 inch rows, so we're going to measure off 17 feet 5 inches. We'll go ahead and stretch that out. And then we'll go ahead and just do a count of how many plants we have out here. Okay. We got 34, so we have 34 plants in this thousandths of an acre, so that means we have 34,000 plants here. Okay. So the target population in this field was right around that 33, 34,000. So it looks like we did a pretty good job as far as that goes. Now do you count all of these plants as part of your total population, or some of them not going to make the way the others will? Well what we'll do is we'll go ahead and count all the plants, but then when it comes to doing what we'd call a potential ear count, so now how many ears will we get out? We might have 34,000 plants, but what were our ear count be, now we'll start taking some away. For example, right here, we have some concern about this, what we'd call a lady merger. Okay. So this lady merger, you can see, has a much skinnier uh, stalk diameter in comparison to these plants that are right here on either side of them. So what we want to do is dig this guy up and try to get, a, get an idea of maybe what's caused the problem here 
okay. uh, that this one came up behind or delayed in comparison to the others. Okay, so you dig it up and now you're looking for the evidence of why. Yeah, when as we dig it up, one thing we want to look at is trying to see, do we see any residue maybe pinched in there? Or maybe once we get it all the way out, we can tell if it's an issue or not uh, with planting depth, etc. So depending on the situation, what we find, a lot of times it'll be planting depth or maybe it's going to be residue pinched down in that seed trench. Okay. So we want to try to get a handle on what happened there. So is that the only kind of plant that we're not are we going to take out of that potential ear count or are there, there are other things that we can see that, that will affect us? There will be other things that, that we can see as well. One of them is going to be looking at the spacing. So here's what we, what we call a double drop. So we've got two plants that are spaced basically right together. Sure. The plants on either side of it here are actually all spaced pretty good. This is actually a double drop from the meter itself, meaning that both these seeds came down the seed tube at the same time because they were on the meter together. Okay. So this is an issue with the meter in this case that we've got this double drop out here. When it comes to ear count, we're going to count one of these, not both of these. Okay. okay. At this point, usually we'll see that one will get a good ear and the other one won't have a very good harvestable ear on it. Okay, great. Uh, other things. Now, if you look at this row here behind us, it, it's all over the place. Yeah, what we have going on in this row, and you can see the spacing is just very, very poor in this row. This is what we'd call some misplaced seed. So what we found out on the planter in this row that the meter was okay, it wasn't an issue with that, we had an issue in the seed tube itself. So as seed was coming down, it was ricocheting inside that seed tube. So we have a tremendous amount of misplaced seed. It happens to be one row. Okay. Ideally, we'd like to try to catch that as we're planting instead of after the fact. But we'd have to go back and really inspect the planter and try to diagnose that row. Why? Why it was happening that way. And if we look down here, it looks like there should be a plant where this orange flag is, but we've got nothing. Yeah, this is what we'd call a true skip. In other words, on both sides here, we've got good plant spacing, and then we just basically got a plant missing. Okay. okay so what we do in this case, we dig this up, see if we can find the seed or not. If there's no evidence of the seed, then we're going to assume that it was a skip due to the meter itself. So then we'd go back to the metering side of it. Okay, sounds good. But it's good to do this early. Yes, it's good to get out here, do this early, try to diagnose problems and issues out in the field to get a better handle on this, this early season stand and potential ear counts this early. Up next, we're talking fertilizers. First, mixing the right rate of phosphorus into starter fertilizer, and later, what's the agronomic difference between 28% and anhydrous ammonia? Ken Ferry has the answer when Corn College TV returns. Think about the way you farm. The Enlist Weed Control System is a proud supporter of this program and forward-thinking growers everywhere. Very simple, very easy program, and today now it's pretty economical as well. It enables us to farm more ground, and not only are we bigger farmers than we used to be, we're also much better. I certainly do think growers should be concerned about uh, weeds becoming resistant. As uh, time goes on and the more information I receive, it's, it's, if it's not here, it's coming here. So try to do the right things to make sure that we can keep this program around as long as we possibly can. I don't think the farmer of 10 years ago is the farmer today. You want to have agriculture take a step backwards. You go back to mechanical control of weeds. But whatever we can do to for forestall the amount of resistant weeds, we should start doing that now. Rust is destroying your valuable equipment and property. Rust Guy permanently stops rust the easy way. No scraping, grinding, or sandblasting. Brush, spray, or roll Rust Guy onto any rusted metal and it will not rust again. Rust Guy is not a paint, but an industrial strength formula that kills rust on contact. It leaves a smooth finish that can be left as is or painted. Rust Guy protects from salt, manure, fertilizer, urine, and rain. Call 888-RUST-GUY to talk to a rust expert or go to rustguy.com. Over the generations, Fertilizer, the unsung hero of the farm, has been in the background 
quietly nourishing crops with very little fanfare. Until now. Meet the next generation of fertilizer. Micro Essentials. What we're looking at here today is trying to identify if I have a response in my starter fertilizer from that phosphorus component. So a lot of times in starter fertilizer we look at things like nitrogen, phosphorus, and zinc as our three primary things that need to be in there. So do you really need phosphorus in your starter? Some different things you can do evaluating that out in your fields is by simply running your starter fertilizer like we have on this side and then we went ahead and shut it off over here. And what we're looking at here was only three gallon of a of a pop-up in furrow fertilizer versus no fertilizer here. So we're not talking a lot of phosphorus, uh, just a small amount of phosphorus placed right in furrow down in that row as we planted the corn. When we're looking at things like phosphorus, one thing that we look at is the color of the corn itself. So as we see a lot of this purple showing up and we get this purple discoloration on these leaves, that shows us that this is a little bit short as far as in phosphorus. So phosphorus deficiency will have these purple plants. You can see on this other side here, which is this plant I have, you can see that we don't have near the amount of purpling in this. So when we put on just a little bit of that extra phosphorus, we're able to take away the purpling as well as get a bigger growth response in this plant. We can see a pretty big difference as far as in the height out here of these plants where we have no phosphorus on here compared to where we've put that phosphorus on. So phosphorus becomes very important, especially early in the season when we're planting. We can have a lot of phosphorus in our soil test uh, levels, but it's not available to actually get into these plants. So we, when we deal with temperature especially, as we get cool temperatures, it really reduces our phosphorus availability. The relative availability when soils are at 50 degrees might only be 20 or 25 percent. If we get soil temperatures up into the 70 degrees, now maybe we can get up in there in that 80, 90 percent availability to try to get this into the plant of that relative availability. So early in the season, if you have things like no-till, or if you just like to get out there and get those early planting dates, those are going to be the places we need to make sure we're targeting some phosphorus fertilizer in with our starter program. Each week we take questions from our viewers for a segment we call Ask the Agronomist. Today our viewers want to know about side dressing. The question, is there any agronomic difference between side dressing with a 28% solution versus anhydrous ammonia? Well, as far as the plant's concerned, it's all going to eventually convert into nitrate in the uptake. Not as big a difference there. There is some difference in availability, meaning that if you had yellow corn and you were out there side dressing, 28 has nitrate in it and nitrate is what turns yellow corn back green so you would see a quicker response to the nitrogen application with 28 than you would anhydrous. We put anhydrous on we are going to create an ammonia core there where basically nothing's going to survive uh, the anhydrous application you're going to kind of freeze dry it if you want to think and you're probably looking at about 14 days before you're going to start to see real good nitrogen release from that core so it's going to be a little bit delayed but at the same time if you're side dressing green corn uh, that 14 delay is a little bit like an inhibitor, meaning that nitrogen is going to be somewhat in place for your anhydrous. So we're going to say two weeks from now it's going to start to mineralize back. Where the 28%, if you put it on today and had a 3 inch rain tomorrow, the nitrate portion could leach away. So one's going to be a little more stabler, slower reacting, one's going to react pretty quick, uh, and you're going to see it in the corn. But beyond that, if we got enough nitrogen to keep the corn green through side dressing and we come out the back end to keep the green corn green to finish, it's not going to make a difference where it gets its nitrogen from. Corn College TV is brought to you in part by SFP, putting revolutionary technology to work in the field and helping producers get more from their crops and their fertilizer dollar. It's not too early to think fall, so protect your phosphorus fertilizer application with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Research shows that fall applied phosphate protected by Avail increases corn yields by eight bushels per acre. That's why it pays to add Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. So save yourself time and money next spring. Talk to your fertilizer dealer today for more information or visit chooseavail.com. Whoa. 
I'm gonna need a bigger combine. Looking for giant yields? Take a look at AgriGold Giants. Exceptional genetics combined with the agronomic expertise of our corn specialists add up to giant results for you. Genetics, agronomics, results. AgriGold, the corn specialist. See more at agrigold.com. Hi, I'm Mike Flores of Flores Trading. And in my 35 years of investing, I'm convinced that market prices can be more likely predicted using technical analysis. My firm specializes in this. We can help you to deploy technical analysis in your marketing and trading decisions. At Flores Trading, you will receive free life quotes 24 hours a day, and you can trade right on your own computer. You can open an account online in five minutes with no paperwork. To get started, call the number below. Hi, I'm Greg Vincent, the editor of AgWeb, and welcome to our new site. This marks the end of many long months by a lot of us here at Farm Journal Media, and also even some of our loyal readers who were dedicated to helping us remain the homepage of agriculture. This new site is designed to have more vibrant content, easier navigation, and faster load times while still delivering the same quality information that you've come to expect from AgWeb over the past 10 years. So go ahead and take a look around the site and let us know what you think. AgWeb, the homepage of agriculture. As those crops grow, it's easy to forget about what's going on below ground, but it's that below ground preparation that can make the difference between uniformity and waves of uneven grain. Today, Ken Ferry is talking tillage transitions in our agronomics of equipment. Ken, we talk an awful lot about uh, vertical tillage. And, but I think some guys may have a question on how do they switch over from what they've always been doing to a new system? And that's, that's a good question because when I look at our own customer base and I see where do we see some of the bigger hiccups take place and the hits and yield, it's usually in a transition from one system to another and not knowing that system and making some mistakes. Moving from horizontal tillage into vertical tillage can bring those along. A grower has to understand vertical tillage is a systems concept so we're using primary tillage in the fall to set the soil profile up to get complete shatter course we may be mixing you may not be whatever your tillage reason is but you got to have complete shatter across that top four or six inches of profile once you've done that then you can bring vertical till harrows through in the spring and you can fit this thing down from the surface okay. instead of horizontally and you're ready to go the problem with our vertical till harrows is they're only going to do so much leveling so we have to think about how much leveling we can do with our primary tillage maybe we add a pass in the fall uh, and then follow it up with a pass in the spring itself Probably number one though is full width shatter. Okay. As this chisel plow here was run deep enough to give me full width shatter from shank to shank. So I can come in here now and I can level this off in the spring and the planter's gonna ride smooth. I'm gonna have uniform moisture moving up to the surface, uniform dry out. This is gonna be a nice start to a vertical till program. Right. But if I take the same chisel and I just shallow it up two, maybe three inches like we've got over here in this other side, it's going to be totally different and have a total different outcome. Well, let's go take a look. So here we've run the same tool. We've just shallowed it up, and we do have that same nice shatter above the shank, right. but we didn't make it all the way across to the splitter shank. In the situation, the splitter shank's running too, too low, and this is running too low to shatter this area out. This is going to be a problem right here. We have corn these columns all the way. We've got through. these columns right here, and the corn planter is going to bounce out of here. The sprayers are going to bounce under. This is going to be a rough ride, but more importantly, when I plant up corn here and I plant corn here, this one's going to grow slow. That one's going to grow fast. So depending on where the row ends up in here, you're going to have very unevenness out there in the field, and it's all due that we haven't prepped this field. If this grower was in a horizontal system and he did this and he took a soil finisher and he sheared this off, then he would have a uniform seed bed. This thing would come up uniform. And we tell our clients we'll take a perfect seed bed and perfect emergence on any layer over a shoddy seed bed on vertical tillage. So to get vertical tillage done right, we have to get the primary tillage right. Unfortunately, too many growers think vertical tillage is just one tool. Add one tool to their system right. and they fixed it. If you add one tool to this system right here and go to vertical tillage, instead of a soil finisher, you're bringing a harrow. 
you're not going to be happy with the outcome. Okay. We've got to have uniform shatter up here in that top four to six inches. So that's really the most important thing if you're switching systems is to make sure you set the tools right to do what you're going to do. That's right. It's one of the most important systems from there. You've got to have that one right to get a uniform emergence. Now you still have more residue to deal with. So your planner has to be set up to handle the residue so you can get it through and you're not pinning residue down and you, and you have to be able to handle that side of it as well as the weed control. A lot of the harrows today, which they're good leveling harrows, but they're not going to do much for taking out weeds. So you have to manage your winter annuals and your grasses if they get out started early. So there's other differences that have to be in play, but this is the number one cause for failure in this system is when we don't get the primary tillage right. And, and again, the grower may have been doing this all his life and he's happy with it in a horizontal format. This is not good enough if we move to a vertical format. Thanks, Ken, and thanks for watching. We hope you found a few of these lessons helpful in your pursuit of higher yields. Remember, if you missed any of these shows, you can always find them online at farmjournalcorncollege.com. Here's what's coming up next week on the show. Coming up next week on Corn College TV, we continue our discussion on early season corn with pointers on managing nitrogen for maximum growth. Plus, planning doesn't always go perfectly. Missy Bauer helps us break out of a serious crusting problem with tips on replant decisions and whether a rotary hoe can help save a crusted field. All that and answers about narrow row corn next week on Corn College TV. We'll see you then. Class dismissed. <laughs>